All right, everybody, I guess we'll get started. So um, this is human-centered security, building for accessibility into security. So uh, I'm gonna start off with a little bit of legalese, so views and opinions disclaimer. This discussion includes my personal views and opinions and may not reflect the views or opinions of Southwest Airlines. I'll also um, go into a little bit of housekeeping and the intended audience for this talk. I'm gonna ask that everyone ho please hold all questions to the end. Um, the conference will distribute this deck via the Sketch app, so if you are looking for this later on, um, and there it will be quite a few um, like resources and uh, citations within this deck, so if you would like those, they will be available. Um, the slides are gonna be narrated to the best of my ability, so I'm sorry if you don't like people reading slides, I'm gonna do it, it is an accessibility thing. So. Uh, additional sources and resources are available at the end of the deck, as I mentioned. If there is any way to make this talk more accessible for you, please reach out to me after the talk. So, um, and this talk is written for security professionals and students wishing to learn more about human-centered security, inclusive security, and accessibility. So. All right, um, so this is me, I'm Cynthia Taylor. So I'm the founder of the WESIS Interest Group, People for Disabilities and Caregivers. Um, in July 2022, I graduated with my master's in cybersecurity and information insurance from WGU, which is an NSA Center of Excellence. Um, in September 2022, I completed Florida Center for Cybersecurity's NSA funded program, CyberWorks. Uh, in 2019, I was a Disability and Next Gen leader and worked for accessibility at WhatsApp and vulnerability management and uh, application security at Boyle Financial. I have over 10 years IT experience and I currently work at Southwest Airlines in application security. Uh, I also have multiple disabilities and I've been a caregiver for over eight years. So we're gonna go right after this into a couple of slides that are gonna explain kind of foundational information regarding um, human-centered security and information, uh, excuse me, inclusive security um, and where it's most needed. So, so some of you may be asking, what is human-centered design or security? So, According to ISO, human-centered design is an approach to interactive systems that aims to make systems usable and useful by focusing on the users, their needs and requirements, and by applying human factors, ergonomics, usability knowledge, and techniques. This approach enhances effectiveness and efficiency, improves human well-being, user satisfaction, accessibility and sustainability, and counteracts possible adverse effects of use on human health, safety, and performance. In essence, human-centered design is about making things with the intention that they're going to be used by people, not machines. Human-centered security is the same concept, but for security. My talk today focuses on, the design uh, on this design concept because it highlights the need for, safety, for safe, secure, and accessible digital products. And as our talk progresses, we'll get a good idea as to what happens when we have products that are designed without these principles. So now we're gonna to touch a little bit on what inclusive cybersecurity is. Accessible and inclusive cybersecurity refers to designing and implementing cybersecurity measures to fit the needs of all individuals. This implies designing policies, procedures, and technologies with those with disabilities or other marginalized groups in mind. The goal of accessible and inclusive cybersecurity is to guarantee that everyone has equal access to the tools and resources necessary for protection from cyber threats, including anyone with limited physical access to digital devices, limited technical skill sets, or other barriers. By making cybersecurity more accessible and inclusive, we can create more equitable and secure digital environments for everyone. So, while similar to human-centered security, inclusive security is slightly different. It focuses more on, basically, um, focuses more on whether or not there are people with low-tech literacy or people with disabilities um, being able to have uh, access to security. 
While human-centered uh, centered security and inclusive security are often talked about as being the same thing, they're kind of a little bit different. So if you're really curious about learning more about inclusive cybersecurity, there actually was a really good talk by two UK um, researchers that was done as a RSA remote talk a couple of months ago, and it's available online. So our last look for foundational knowledge, we're gonna go into kind of understanding the difference between disability, accessibility, and accommodations. So disability is something you have, much like biometrics are something you have. So accessibility is a feature. It's sometimes, it's something that's created to make something uh, else usable for people with disabilities. Accommodations is something we do or change for someone with a disability. This could be as simple as letting someone leave work early to go to the doctor's office. Often when we make something accessible, we only think about it for people with specific types of disabilities. So in some cases like mobility disabilities or people with permanent disabilities like people who are deaf. We miss the opportunity to look at how to make things more accessible with making um, for people with uh, situational or temporary disabilities. I've used like text-to-speech features before when I've had laryngitis. Um, another good example of this is things like curb cuts. So curb cuts are things that are meant for people who have mobility disabilities, but they're often used by people who have um, baby strollers. Um, you'll also see people with scooters and bikes and things like that that will also use curb cuts. So at its core, we need to remember that accessibility makes things better for everyone. Um, this slide actually comes courtesy of Microsoft. So um, you'll see in this slide, they have uh, four different types of disabilities. Um, and in this case, you'll see that they illustrate actually permanent, temporary, and situational disabilities, which is something that we don't always see addressed. Most people tend to just think of the permanent disability. So now that we have a better idea as far as what disability and accessibility are, um, we're gonna take a brief look at the legal side of digital accessibility. So what is web accessibility and WCAG? Per w3.org, web accessibility means that websites, tools, and technologies are designed and developed so that people with disabilities can use them. More specifically, people can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web, contribute to the web. Web Content Accessibility Gu Guidelines, or WCAG 2.0, defines how we make web content more accessible to people with disabilities. Accessibility involves a wide range of disabilities, including visual, auditory, physical, speech, cognitive, language, learning, and neurological disabilities. Although these guidelines cover a wide range of issues, they are not able to address the needs of people with all types, degrees, and combinations of disability. These guidelines also make web content more usable by older individuals with language abilities due to aging and often improve usability for users in general. Now, WCAG was developed by W3 as kind of a missing piece in digital accessibility. Now, these guidelines were developed, when these guidelines were developed, nobody had defined what someone needed to do to make website digitally accessible. It's these guidelines that many companies are held legally account accountable to and soon potentially the US government. Now that we've covered all the foundational information, we'll go into um, one of our first case studies. In this case, um, I will read this passage that's going to, that comes out of a uh, article from W3. Uh, While online users continue to broadly to report finding traditional CAPTCHAs frustrating to, compete, to complete, it is generally assumed that an interactive CAPTCHA can be resolved within a few incorrect attempts. The point of, the, of distinction for people with disabilities is that a CAPTCHA can not only separate computers from humans, but also often prevents people with disabilities from performing the requested procedure. For example, asking users who are blind, visually impaired, or dyslexic to identify textual characters in a distorted graphic is asking them to perform a task they are intrinsically incapable to accomplish. Similarly, asking users who are or deaf, hard of hearing, or living with auditory processing disorder to identify and transcribe 
in writing the content of an audio CAPTCHA is asking them to perform a task they are intrinsically least likely to accomplish. Furthermore, traditional CAPTCHAs have generally presumed that all users can read and transcribe English-based words and characters, thus making the test inaccessible to a large number of non-English speaking web users worldwide. Frankly, a design pattern that expects multiple attempts from users as a matter of course is arguably inaccessible by design to persons living with an anxiety disorder as well as to many living with a range of other cognitive and learning disabilities. So this is a pretty well-known case where security is inaccessible. This text comes directly from w3.org and is often cited in accessibility talks as a problem. Fortunately, there are alternatives out there that are more accessible. ReCAPTCHA, which is a product by Google, fulfills the same function as CAPTCHAs while being a screen reader compatible um, option. Hopefully, we'll see more um, accessible options available in the future. This is case study two. So three years ago, Anna, and this is not her real name, was diagnosed with a neurological autoimmune disease in which her body attacks substances that are naturally found in the body, causing pain and vision loss. Before her diagnosis, Anna worked in software technology and felt confident and safe online. She now uses glasses, a magnifying glass, and screen magnification where needed. Anna has no peripheral vision or depth perception. Face ID or pr uh, proving her identity by taking a photo of herself on her phone are impossible as she does not have the vision to line up to uh, line up her face with the camera. So, um, I worked for WhatsApp a few years ago, and I participated in an annual hackathon they have there. During the hackathon, we actually created a uh, feature using existing functionality within iOS that allows visually impaired users to actually perform what um, they're not capable of doing within this app. You would actually hold it up and it will give you auditory cues on how to position your face so that they'll fit within the frame and then it gives a countdown and takes a photo. So this feature, um, the last time I was involved was still available in the iOS beta version for WhatsApp. I don't know if it actually made it out to production. So, um, but this is kind of an example of the fact that there are solutions that are available for a lot of these issues. So, as I mentioned in case study one and two, there are now alternatives or potential solutions that can be created. However, issues like these ha can be avoided by having more awareness in development. Many companies developing software are now offering accessibility awareness training to developers. To give an idea, this would be something like um, somebody might put a blindfold on you, hand you a device that has the screen reader enabled on it, and then ask you to navigate in the device. So you can also have things like, um, in some cases, some people may hand you special glasses. This can simulate things like retina pigmentosa or other uh, low vision issues that can occur so that you can get an idea of what interacting with a device with those visual impairments feels like. So, uh, For anyone with an AppSec background, you'll be familiar with the term secure by design. It's that idea to make uh, something secure, you need to start in the design phase. Uh, much, as sec much like security, accessibility also starts in design. Adding accessibility onto something after the fact is often an awful experience for both developers and users. It's pretty much the same thing for security as well. And last, just as we, uh, we pen test something to ensure it's secure, we need to make certain certain um, those items are going through accessibility testing as well um, to make certain they're actually accessible for all users. Um, in the end, this is all about agile practices and shifting left to avoid problems in production. So up until this point, we've discussed what happens when we create security products that aren't accessible. Um, I'm gonna flip this around and address it from a different direction now. Um, this is what happens when we don't address accessibility as a, um, or I should say we've addressed accessibility as a part of, um, as missing, as what happens when accessibility is missing security. So in this case, we create an attack surface. So. According to NIST, the definition of an attack surface is the set of points on the boundary of a system, a system element, 
or an environment where an attacker can try to enter, cause an effect on, or extract data from that system, system element, or environment. In 2020, MITRE introduced sub, uh, sub-technique event trigger execution accessibility features as part of privilege escalation and persistence tactics. Adversaries may establish persistence and or elevate privileges by executing malicious content triggered by accessibility features. Windows contains accessibility features that may be launched with a key combination before a user has logged in. Example, when the user is on the Windows login screen, an adversary can modify the way these programs are launched to get a command prompt or backdoor without logging into the system. So this is not intended to be a comprehensive list, but more of an overall illustration of how long uh, this problem's been going on and how prevalent the issue is. Accessibility didn't become a attack surface recently, nor is it limited to one platform. For those of you curious about why Android's accessibility suite is featured, there are uh, several technical breakdowns that are available, um, and they are included in the um, resources at the end of the talk. I will go over a few of the ones that are listed up here. Um, CVE 2011-1247, untrusted search pass vulnerability in the Microsoft Active Accessibility component in Microsoft Windows, uh, XP SP2, SP3, Windows Server 2003 SP2, Windows Vista SP2, Windows Server 2008, uh, and Windows 7 Gold and several others allows users to gain privileges via Trojan Horse DLL in the current working directory, AKA Active Accessibility Insecure Library Loading Vulnerability. Um, CBE 2016-5273 is a function in the accessibility implementation of Mo uh, Mozilla Firefox 49.0. It allows remote attackers to execute arbitrary code via crafted website. CBE 2016-39 23 is accessibility services Android 7.0 before October 1st, 2016 mishandle motion events, which allows attackers to conduct touch jacking attacks and consequently gain privileges via a crafted application. Uh, 2018, we had Trojan spy use to steal messages from WhatsApp via accessibility services. 2011, information disclosure vulnerability in Microsoft's accessibility insight for web. Uh, 2022 is Anubis Baking Trojan masquerading as a baking app in the Play Store. Um, and there's actually been multiple baking Trojans that have come out. Um, like you'll see here, uh, Gustav is on here as well. Um, a lot of them use the Android accessibility suite in order to access your device. Um, 2023 backdoor uh, suite that does screen monitoring and remote controlling via the Android accessibility suite. Um, there is a key logger that gets an honorable mention to go up in here where it's pretending to be an accessibility uh, feature in 2017. And uh, recently, ChatGPT posed as a blind person to circumvent anti-bot checks. So now that we've talked about accessibility as an attack surface, and we've gotten a good idea of how um, insecure accessibility and ex inaccessible uh, security looks like, we're gonna get an idea of what kind of legislation may actually fix this, um, these issues in the future. Um, so we have governance, risk, and control for human-centered security. Um, and we're gonna start off with the National Cybersecurity Strategy, which recently came out in March 2023. It's a 39-page initiative. If you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend reading it because it's gonna um, kind of outlining what's gonna happen with the US government um, and cybersecurity for the US going forward. Uh, markets, um, I've kind of taken a little passage out of here, um, out of the entire, um, the entire initiative, and I'm just going to go over this portion of it. Markets impose inadequate costs on and often reward those entities that introduce vulnerable products or services into our digital ecosystem. Too many vendors ignore best practices for secure development, ship products with insecure default configurations or known vulnerabilities, and integrate third-party software of unvetted or unknown provenance. Software makers are able to leverage their market position to fully disclaim liability by contract, further reducing their incentive to follow secure by design principles or perform pre-release testing. Poor software security greatly increases system, uh, systemic risk across the digital ecosystem and leave American citizens bearing the ultimate cost. 
So what we're starting to see here is government agencies are coming out and holding software and hardware developers accountable for introducing vulnerable products. Um, the FDA actually just recently came out with a mandate for medical device manufacturers um, requiring that they do software testing. So to kind of continue along this, and this is actually something that I recently added in, um, CISA just released their cybersecurity strategic plan literally last week. Um, this is their roadmap for the next three years about what they're looking for and what they're going to kind of work around. Um, again, this is a little tiny snippet of kind of what they're looking at, but coordinate, coordinate uh, disclosure of hunt for and drive mitigation of critical and exploitable vulnerabilities, understand how attacks really occur and how to stop them, drive development of trustworthy technology products, understand and reduce cybersecurity risks posed by emergent technologies. So it's really relevant because it talks about uh, mitigating vulnerabilities, getting to the root cause analysis for issues, and creating good products and reducing risk associated with new technologies. So the last two slides were about more about the cybersecurity side of things. So where we're also going to see changes at are coming from the DOJ as well as for ADA. So this was just released in March 2022. It's guidance on web accessibility in the ADA. Inaccessible web content means that people with disabilities are denied equal access to information. An inaccessible website can exclude people just as much as steps of an entrance to a physical location. Ensuring web accessibility for people with disabilities is a priority for the Department of Justice. In recent years, a multitude of services have moved online and people rely on websites like never before for all aspects of daily living. For example, access, uh, accessing voting information, finding up-to-date health and safety resources, and looking up mass transit schedules and fare information increasingly depends on having access to websites. So if you weren't aware, the DOJ enforces ADA. So. Uh, the above passage comes directly from them after numerous landmark digital lawsuits. They've now created mandatory guidelines for private businesses. So this is specifically for private businesses, not, public, not the government, uh, to follow regarding web accessibility. This change comes after over 30 years of the ADA being out. The ADA came out in the 90s. So this is another late addition. Um, there's been a lot going on in the last two weeks. Uh, the Justice Department advances proposed rule to strengthen web and mobile app access for people with disabilities. The Justice Department sent to the Federal Register for publication a notice of proposed rulemaking under Title II of the American Di with Disabilities Act, ADA, that aims to improve web and mobile application apps, access for people with disabilities, and clarify how public entities, primarily state and local governments, can meet their existing ADA obligations as many of their activities shift online. This marks the first time in history of the American Disabilities Act that the Justice Department has issued a proposed rule on web, website accessibility. Um, this is according to the Attorney General Merrick B. Garland. This proposed rule seeks to ensure that Americans with disabilities have equal access to the websites and apps that connect them to essential services provided by state and local governments. So this literally also just came out at the end of last month, and the DOJ is basically doubling down on WCAG, um, as this is gonna be the de facto uh, technical standard going forward for ADA for websites, potentially, if it passes. So this is actually taking comments right now. It is on the Federal Register, if anybody wants to actually comment on this. Um, so, and to be specific, they're looking at adding WCAG 2.0. Um, it'll be the AA standard. And this will be the um, specifically for um, U.S. government websites going forward if this passes. All right, so we're going to wrap up now, um, and I'm going to give some key takeaways. Or today I learned. Um, number one, an estimated 1.3 billion people experience significant disability. This represents 16 percent of the world's population or one in six people, per the WHO. Per CDC in the US, that's one in four adults. If you get nothing else from this talk, please remember this. 
Various disabilities mean that people's interaction patterns are quite diverse. Security interfaces that fail to cater for this diversity can leave a, particularly, a particular population exposed to a vulnerability, essentially making them an attractive target. This unfortunately mirrors real ex uh, existing real world behavior and is therefore a threat to general security. So for context, when you're creating a product, um, and this is more maybe for people with, uh, who've been product owners, if you're creating a product for 1.3 billion people and you're not looking at people with disabilities, you're gonna run into some issues. So um, you're gonna basically be alienating a rather large portion. The, for the second passage, this comes directly from w3.org and is why both human security Human-centered security and inclusive security matter. Again, if you don't understand the audience you're building for, there's a potential that you're creating a vulnerability or opportunity for attackers. Um, number three, uh, in case anybody's wondering why we're, I'm doing a talk on human-centered security, um, it is actually trending um, on dark reading, so at least with Gartner. So, and lastly, I will say the purpose of this talk is to actually have a conversation. So. Um, I would ask that anybody here today, if you, you know, whether you're a student or a professional, um, if you go back, you know, whether to school or to your job or anything else like that, um, definitely talk to other people and say, hey, you know, like I wanna make certain that our security products get accessibility tested. And if you're working on accessibility products that, you know, that you kind of maybe work with your security team. So um, accessibility starts in design and so does security. So, and a lot of the issues we're actually seeing is because we're kind of working in silos. So, so I have a lot of additional sources. Um, again, I, they will be distributing this app via a shed in case anybody has any questions or would like to look at anything that I've got. Um, I would also highly recommend as far as resources um, if you would like to learn more about this subject, uh, definitely read Accessibility is Privacy and Security. Um, that, that particular page has been around for quite a while and it goes even more in depth into this. Um, and there's a lot of actually really great um, other papers that are up here as well. So. Wrap this up a little early. So I wanna say thanks to everybody who showed up. So that's my information in case you need it. So. And if anybody has any questions, you're more than welcome to ask them, so. So earlier, I might have missed it on the slide, but um, you mentioned there's like actual tools and technologies you can use to help build with accessibility in mind from the get-go. Mm -hmm. um, are there any like startups or services, just like names, that help um, on a more affordable, let's say, way to you know, apply, like for example, I know there's like the screen color modifier so you could see how different people's visual perception differences might see it, but across the different four spectrums of temporary to permanent disability, um, do you know of any teams that you endorse or are doing interesting things in the space? Um, for small to medium businesses, it's kind of hard to find some groups that can help with that, unfortunately. Um, there are some really, really great uh, larger groups that are available. Um, Level access is one of them that you can kind of go and talk with as well. Um, as far as accessibility testing, they're actually, um, Google actually puts out an application that's available that will, um, if you're like in your own um, web developer, you can actually go back and test your own application. It will not cover the full spectrum of WCAG, unfortunately, and all the different items that are available. So um, a lot of times it's kind of easier to kind of pair up with, um, there's different groups on like Facebook and stuff like that, where they have accessibility testers that are on there um, because they're kind of just community focused and they will try to help you out so to a degree. So I would just tell people to kind of reach out to the overall community. It's the same thing for like PDF testing as well. It can get kind of complicated, so. And you guys are more than welcome to ask me questions that um, are more broad scale for accessibility or for security. So I do AppSec, so. Or you can, guys can ask me questions about conferences, so that's cool.
Hi. Um, color. Mm -hmm. Okay, most of the stuff they're doing, I can't read. They think that they've got some magic for colorblind, but I can't read it. And I find it really ugly. I try to tell people and my students to do high contrast, get a color wheel and do opposite colors for your text and your um, things because that is readable by anything. And it's because some of the, I've seen some really strange things people say, well, now you can read it. No, no I can't. Um, and I'm not going to get into why I can't read it. But when I teach it, it's pick opposite colors on the color wheel to give the high contrast. Yeah, it's the um, availability of contrast within applications sometimes is kind of difficult. Same thing for websites. Um, and then I've also seen in some cases where uh, people are not aware that there's multiple different types of colorblindness that are out there. So um, people will, I've seen stuff, um, there's one of the more common is red-green colorblindness. So a lot of times people will put up stuff in Christmas colors um, and then not be aware that people actually can't see that. So, or that it's gonna come out in grayscale to that person. So um, there's also, um, I know there's one with blue as well. So I've seen a lot of people sometimes come back and say that they can't see it or if it's there, they can't see it at all. In some cases, depending on the shade of blue. Um, the easiest way to think about this is if you tried to put yellow text on a white background, that's really hard for most people to read. That's kind of what you're doing to users when you don't think about color contrast. Um, and there are tools that are available within the um, like Chrome Web App Store that you can test within the browser if you're doing uh, web app development. And then there's also high contrast that's available as well. Sometimes people uh, will color stuff in different apps and things like that in a way that actually makes it hard for um, contrasting to work. So that's another thing to look at is to actually turn on the accessibility options that are available to sit down and see what your application or website looks like um, with accessibility tools enabled. Um, I've had people tell me that their stuff totally works. Um, and when I went to it, I found out that it didn't. So. Hello, thank Hello. you for the talk. Um, I, uh, that what you said about uh, developers, security, you know, teams, and accessibility, like working in silos, I think really struck me. I'm curious kind of like what you would say are some good best practices for these teams working together like earlier in the pipeline, you know, and, and I, I feel like there's probably, there's usually like a set of common language for one, you know, maybe, maybe we can I don't know, form some bridges there. I'm just curious to know like what you would say are, are good practices generally for that type of life cycle. So we're we're going back to like standard agile. So in agile you're not all you're not supposed to be like this person works over here, or that person works over there. You're supposed to get together and be a team. Um, in one company I work for, CVS Aetna, actually I was doing accessibility testing for them. Um, we were all involved at the design process in the beginning. So one of the easiest things, because I knew who was doing security because we were all there together, we could very easily have just started a conversation and said, hey, what are you guys doing over here for this sprint? Oh, well, I'm doing this. Well, what are you doing? I'm doing this. So we all could have had a conversation around these stories, which should be happening anyway within Agile. Um, but the problem is, is that I see in a lot of companies, um, much like security, accessibility just gets bolted on afterwards. And therefore, because you're trying to make something accessible that wasn't accessible to start with, or trying to make something secure that wasn't secure to start with, these groups haven't spoken to one another and they're kind of working by themselves. So it goes all the way back to secure by design, accessible by design. So start in design and start that conversation and basically just have everyone there and be present. Um, I've seen some people, they tend to do accessibility testing with third party companies at the end. And it's great for catching very obvious stuff but you won't catch the design issues, and if you do, it's gonna be way too late to fix them, as is common for any kind of security problem. So um, my biggest thing is try to get everybody together and get them together in the beginning. So, and then it may not seem natural for accessibility and security to talk to one another, but it's really not that different. I transition from accessibility into security, and a lot of it is the same. Um, I would teach developers you know, about why something needs to be accessible or why this is an issue and stuff like that. And it's the same thing for AppSec. 
I still teach accessible um, developers why something needs to be secure and why this is a problem and stuff like that. So um, it seems like maybe it's not natural, but it is. So anybody else? I mean, if you want to share stories too, that's totally cool. I know people were sharing stories about threat modeling in the last talk I was in. So. point about the threat modeling thing, mm -hmm. um, I was reading for school an uh, article in Newsmax and it was political, but it made sense for cybersecurity because they mentioned that with Russia and the war maybe spreading, you know, from mm -hmm. the Ukraine to other areas, that um, the, the cybersecurity professionals are who really defend us in the next war by being able to comprehend the attacks and and be be the warrior or so to speak I just wanted to mention that because I know the political aspect they're usually they rely on the military now they're relying on cybersecurity professionals yeah that is has gotten pretty big now so they um, I know we have Space Force which is pretty awesome too so yeah. Yeah. yeah I know the fight right now is about where it's going to be at so uh, whether it's going to stay in Colorado Springs or move to Huntsville so um, anybody else? You just talking about Space Force? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, that's good, because I heard. Yeah, I had heard um, they, did, they made the main decision about it because they would be, uh, what is it, they'd be able to stand it up within a month or something like that after if they kept it there versus if they sent it to Huntsville, it wouldn't be ready for like something crazy like 10 years or something, I don't know. I'd read something, uh, saw something about it, so yeah. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to wrap it up. So uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. So if you guys have any questions uh, and you don't want to ask in front of everybody else and the camera and the rest of it, you're more than welcome to come, come find me. You can ask me about my background, too. Um, I'm not one of those people that particularly cares uh, if somebody wants to ask me about conferences or other things like that. If you just want to have a conversation, that's totally cool as well. So.